people are remembering the interconnectedness of of our own actions and and how they keep other people healthy, right? I mean, I, I think um, you know, for for when when facial coverings first we started talking about facial coverings, um, Doctor uh, Doctor Lowe, our medical director, um, the mayor, and I both kept trying to say to her like, so, but it protects people themselves, right? It really does keep us safe. And she kept saying, you can't really say that. That's not actually the case. Not these kinds of coverings. Um, it's really about protecting others and protecting your neighbors. Um, and the thought that we're in that facial covering is, to, is, is much more about the people that you see and you interact with and engage with. And I think taking that well beyond facial coverings, but taking it into you know, what's happening in our community needs us to remember that we're interconnected. Welcome to tonight's program on addressing community inequalities during the COVID-19 recovery. I'm Tim Ritchie, president of the Museum of Science. The Museum of Science is glad to be able to provide a forum for tonight's discussion. As people of science, we deeply believe that humans are born problem solvers. In fact, that among the things it means to be a human is to solve problems in innovative ways. Among the things that we need to solve is persistent poverty. It is generational poverty and it is pervasive hunger among us and the healthcare effects of being hungry. These are avoidable problems, solvable problems by our community and it vexes us all that they aren't being solved. There are times you walk past a problem in your community and you say, it's not supposed to be that way. It isn't supposed to be that way in the richest country in the world and one of the most literate cities in, the, in this country. And also in this particular case, what's especially vexing is that it is solvable. So for tonight's panel, you'll be able to engage in this conversation. And my sense is that you wouldn't even be here tonight watching it if you didn't feel this way as well. I'm especially glad that our moderator tonight is Kara Miller, who is the host and executive editor of Innovation Hub from WGBH and PRI. She started Innovation Hub in 2011 and launched it nationally in 2014. Kara's show focuses on creative thinking in areas from healthcare to transportation, technology to education. She also contributes to The Takeaway, a national radio program hosted by John Hockenberry, and WGBH's Morning Edition. I'd also like to say that Kara has a an exhibit that we feature at the museum called Wicked Smart, and we're so glad that she brought that to us as well. Her writing has appeared in the Boston Globe, the National Journal, the Boston Herald, the Huffington Post, Atlantic.com. She holds a PhD from Tufts and a BA from Yale and has taught at the University of Massachusetts and at Babson College. Kara, thank you so much for hosting us tonight, and I'll turn it over to you. Tim, thank you so much. I'm really glad that uh, Museum of Science, the WGABH are doing this. And I, I, this is a particularly exciting panel because these are people on the ground who are really, I think can really speak to what's happening right now and give us a picture that, um, that many of us really don't have. So I'm very excited about that. A few housekeeping things. Um, I should say the sort of part one of this of this town hall was March 9th, um, hosted by my colleague Arun Roth. And it was like one of the last days that anybody was together inside in a big meeting space. Um, and you know, it's been kind of a while now. Um, and this is really part two, where at the very beginning when Arun hosted, the question was like, what is this coronavirus thing? What's going on? And now we're really thinking about what does the future look like? We kind of know what it is. What does the future like it look like? What do we do? In Massachusetts, at least, we have very fortunately seen a huge um, drop off in cases. But at the same time, we have seen a huge spike in economic insecurity. And um, we'll talk a lot about food. We, there's issues of evictions. There's just all sorts of issues that people are living through right now. Uh, without further ado, let me just say a little bit, and I'm just saying a very little bit about each of our participants. I know you can read more about them, but I just want to kind of introduce them to you before we get underway. Um, Catherine D'Amato has been in the food industry since age eight, so, you know, a little while. Um, 
And uh, her Italian immigrant father opened a restaurant in California, and she's led the Greater Boston Food Bank since 1995. Uh, Dr. Holly O is the Chief Medical Director at the Dimmick Center. She's a practicing uh, pediatrician, and she uh, used to serve as their Chief Medical Officer. And our last panelist, um, last but not least, is Marty Martinez. He's the chief of the mayor's office, um, health and human services for the city of Boston, which is the largest agency within city government. He oversees 10 departments, including for one, uh, the Boston Public Health Commission. And I think I wanna start by asking all of you, and Holly, maybe I'll start with you. Um, so we have seen, as I was saying, hospitalizations in Massachusetts I mean, this is really the good news to start off with. Um, they've declined something like 70%, depends on the day you're looking, sometimes it's more or less, but we've also seen economic instability really skyrocket. And I wonder how these two forces of caseloads dropping, but, but real questions about what the path forward looks like, how does that play out on the ground for you? Yeah. Um... Thanks. Thanks for this. It's really great to have the opportunity to chat, particularly from Dimmick, which is a community health center, sort of it, as you were, as it were, right on the ground. Um, you know, it's interesting because we have in Massachusetts, we've seen this drop in case rates. Um, you know, people might think, wow, are we over the hump? You know, the infections are down way low. But really, sort of what we're seeing on the ground at the community health center is all these economic impacts have, will have very far reaching, very long reaching reverberating impacts. Um, on our patients and our families. Um, and that plays out in a few different ways. Um, you know, some of the most obvious might be things like, you know, many families, they might have lost their employer-sponsored health insurance, for example, and that's scary, right? They've lost their insur insurance, they may have lost their provider. That's where places like Dimmick can actually really help community health centers because they have enrollment counselors that can help people navigate the insurance landscape. They take mass health, they've got sliding fee scales. But even going beyond that, there are so many other reverberating factors that also impact health and wellness. So things like access to healthy food, um, gaps in childcare, poor access to education, housing, you know, people who are at risk for eviction, um, all of those things in their own ways will have huge impacts on our patients and our families' health and wellness that I'm sure we're going to cover really over the next half hour. Um, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about like the food angle of this and what you've seen change over the last few months, which I'm sure has been considerable? Sure. I mean, like Dr. Ho, these are long lasting um, impacts that are going to be with our community for a long time relative to trying to move folks from hunger to health in the collaboratory. We're feeling a huge setback. Right? There were one in 13 residents of Eastern Massachusetts on March first that are food ins were food insecure. Now it's one in eight and one in six as a child. And so these are dramatic numbers that we've been seeing. So we've been trying to run as fast as we can and raise enough money and acquire enough food to try the best to address this. So to put it in context, you know, from 1 million pounds of food going out the door, we're now seeing 2.5 to 3 million pounds of food going out the door each week. So from 1 million to almost 3 million a week. And if you uh, calibrated that out all year, it'd be about from 50 million meals annually to about 83 to 85 million meals annually. It's a crisis and uh, we wanna make sure that people have access to fresh foods on a regular basis. And uh, we firmly believe that this is gonna be with us for a while. Marty, do you wanna talk about like what you're seeing? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Kara, and, and thanks for having this conversation. Um, you know, absolutely, to both Dr. O and, and Catherine's point, I mean, what we're seeing play out um, is across the city, we see folks not only physically impacted, I think we have roughly uh, 13,000 folks who have been uh, COVID positive in the city of Boston, but the number of folks impacted are much greater than those who, who, who've come down with COVID. Um, and I think that that's a critically important piece to remember. I'll also stress that, um, you know, not all impacts created equal. The disproportionate impact that we see um, yes. is not surprising. Um, and unfortunately, it's critically important that we don't lose sight of the inequities that are there, um, which is what the city's seeing every day, from food, to access to housing, to access to you know, economic opportunity, the disproportionate impact is real. 
So Marty, maybe I can follow up on that with you. When you talk to just people in the city, which I'm sure you do every day, and you kind of hear, here's what's going on. What are you hearing? Like, can you bring me into the kind of instability, insecurity that you're talking about on a high level, but what does that feel like? If, if you can think of a specific example or the kind of interaction you have with somebody. Yeah, I mean, I, I give you a real specific example. When someone who may be, you know, moderate, moderate symptoms goes and gets a test at a community health center like Dr. O's um, and ends up testing positive, but lets the public health nurse know through the tracing process that they really don't have anywhere they can stay, that they live with their, you know, their aunt, their cousin, maybe another family member with extended family. Um, they live in a densely populated living situation. Um, maybe someone's already struggling because they lost their job or they're furloughed. Um, and, and now not only do they not want to go home and we, and we want them to be able to isolate to not infect others, um, but they also need to figure out how to still support their families and navigate that in our community. Right. So I think that's a real example of how people are trying to manage both an infectious disease crisis, but also an economic one. So can I just ask you, if somebody tests positive and let, let's say they don't have, you know, they're not going to need to go to the hospital, it's not a, a very severe case, and they do say, well, I've moved in with these people because I lost my job in this restaurant, whatever, and then you're worried they'll go home and infect five more people, what do you do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had to work with not only our community health centers, but with the state to create opportunities for folks to be able to find, you know, temporary place, whether it's a hotel that we've been able to work with through the city or through the state. Um, but one of the most, one of the factors that puts you most at risk for COVID is if you live with lots of people in your home. I mean, it's because that's how spread occurs. And so there's no question that to, for our message has been stay at home. Right, that's been our message. Stay home, don't go out, social distance from others. Um, if you get COVID though, and you live with other people, we don't want you to be home. <laughs> we want you to figure out how not to infect others. So just the, the dynamic of this crisis has um, really put people in, in risk for many, many ailments in the community. Dr. O, do you wanna talk about, you know, in your experience, something that maybe people wouldn't expect or the kind uh, what kind of interaction are you having are you seeing the way that this is like a something specific the way that this really plays out yeah i mean i, I think i just want to highlight um what um, marty was mentioning that you know um the disproportionate impact it has on different sort of communities and in particular just having i think us as um officials or different people in in different professional roles asking the next layer of questions to know how best to support um, people and families and so forth. So as an example, you know, I think a little bit about there was a case that actually um, Dimmick uh, was uh, helped with a few weeks ago. Um, it was a brand new family to us. She was a single mom with four kids. She was an essential worker. So she, she actually got ill with COVID through her work. She had to go to work um, and was hospitalized, which left uh, the 15 year old in charge to care for all the younger siblings. Wow. Then the 15 year old started feeling ill, leaving the 11 year old in charge of the rest of the younger siblings. So, and by the way, Spanish is their primary language. Um, and actually, at, it was at this point that Dimic actually learned them as a new family to our um, uh, primary care clinic. And it was, you know, sort of our resource coordinators, our nurses who spoke Spanish, by the way, to try to help navigate, first of all, like making sure that 15 year old was safe, making sure they had food delivered to the home and so forth, making sure there was a family friend who could safely check in on that family, and then sort of liaising with the hospital to sort of help um, discuss a reasonable discharge timeline for that mother, right? Fortunately, she's recovered, but now sort of their journey sort of continues on. She's got to return to work. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't even talked about the school that these, you know, the four kids really haven't been able to engage in because there's no good, reliable technology at home and the two younger kids who but they don't have sort of uh, adult supervision, you know, so there's, there's layer upon layer upon layer of, um, impact. Um, and sometimes I think if, you know, I think as Marty was saying, if, if sort of the message is stay at home, and that's true, the message is, but we're not sort of understanding the layers upon layers of um, scenarios and situations that I think we as agencies, officials, professionals that are supposed to support our communities, we need to know about these things and ask those next layers so we can really help um, families 
successfully navigate this, whether it's the initial infection or all the economic, school, food impacts that happen later on. Um, you know, it's the places like Dimmick where we try to ask those questions and then try to connect up with great partners to help um, help families navigate um, what they need to to stay safe and stay healthy. Um, Catherine, do you want to talk about like a specific family or person, the kind of interactions that you have around food, why people are needing it, what what's going on in their lives? Sure. Well. In, when, in March 1st, we're serving about 400,000 people in 190 cities and towns in Eastern Mass, Boston, which is the largest city and, uh, and has a very unique set of challenges. Now it's running somewhere between, it could be as high as 900,000, but mm -hmm. let's just say it's 800,000. So the kinds of models, I think, is one of the things that we're being deeply challenged by. So throughout Eastern Mass, there's a network of about 550 agencies, you know, food pantries, uh, meal programs, shelters, after-school programs, all types of food-related programs. And as has already been noted very well um, by Marty and Dr. Ho, you, you want people to stay home. <laughs> you want people to shelter in place. You want them to be very careful. Even in our own workforce, we have about 40% of our workforce in the building or out in community every day. So these models are challenging. We've had to close some pantries um, just in case they can't provide food. I think um, Boston's got a very good model around home delivery, working with the YMCA. And that has just been an awesome thing because that, that didn't happen before, nor did drive-through pantries or grab-and-go or curbside. What I think is interesting that we're facing, and this is, a, this is part of the disproportionate uh, reality, is all the ways that people got their food in the lane that had money are now ways that we are being challenged to get food to people who don't have the same resources. Home delivery is a common practice for lots of people, right. not for people who fee are, fee are seeking food assistance. So these are models that are gonna have to be built and utilizing the experiences so that we can get that food to people. So it's not so much an individual story as much as this is a challenge in now the emergency feeding system to balance your health and your access to fresh fruits and vegetables and healthy food. You know, let me just follow up with on that with you, but anybody else can chime in too. Um, uh, you know, I talked uh, not that long ago on the show to, um, uh, uh, to Darius Mozafarian, who's a cardiologist, but he's also the, the head of the Tufts um, School of Nutrition. And one of the things he talked about is we've seen in the data that's come out of both New York, but then also other countries that have dealt with COVID-19, that you know, metabolic health and obesity is a, is a real risk factor. Um, but one of the things that's traditionally been true about food pantries is that very often the, the food you get is not the most healthy food. And so how do you, how, how do you in some ways like position people in the best possible way to be ready or to be healthier, right? To yeah. fight coronavirus yeah. um, if they don't have access to the healthy food. You know, I'll well, I hope the Greater Boston Food Bank is trying is working hard yeah. to solve that problem yeah. because over almost 85% of our distribution is a fresh, uh, a perishable product, so fresh or frozen. And we've seen a huge migration towards the ability to use fresh foods and using click and cook and teaching methods and, and cultural sensitivity of foods, etc. But um, it is a challenge in COVID because people have moved from fresh to either frozen or dry. And that's where we have heard many stories about items are not available in grocery stores, mm -hmm. particular things, because everybody's wanting the same item. But we have a deep commitment to ensuring that the access to food is access to healthy food that is consistent and available. And I think we would all agree, uh, Marty and Dr. Ho and I, that that's part of what the Hunger to Health Collaboratory is about. How do you increase that access make sure the policies are there for fair and equitable distribution. This is not an issue of food. This is a major issue of access and even more so how disproportionate it is 
in communities of color and, and communities, immigrant communities all across America. I don't know if anybody else wanted to get in on that and she wanted to give you the option if she did. So, okay, so let's think going forward. Um, clearly, uh, as a state, we've been through a lot. As a country, we're going through a lot. How do you, in, I mean, you're all kind of in your own respective areas, but how do you think about this a year out, two years out, three years out? Because um, we might have a vaccine soon, but we also might not. It's, it's very hard to, you know, we can't say for sure that we're going to. So how do you kind of think about this and plan for this long term? Um, Marty, do you want to take that first? Yeah. I mean, Kara, I think that's the one of the main pieces to try to figure out. I mean, we're talking about immediate sort of situations and the city's having conversations right now about schools, right? And let's be clear, the conversation about schools goes back to the conversation Catherine brought up. The conversation about schools links to uh, year-round meals and it links to the ability for enrichment and loss of learning and all the pieces that are encompassed in this notion of is it safe to go back to school and so I think thinking the fact planning for both short term today tomorrow the summer but also then planning for what happens until we have a vaccine I think in most cases and, and Dr. O I'm sure has more information than I but in most cases I think people will tell you a vaccine with widespread distribution for folks isn't going to happen until the spring likely um, and so although there may be a vaccine that comes sooner the ability to really have widespread distribution is going to take time so I think it's really important to keep that all those in mind as we think about how we phase in a real opening. Um, and I just said it today that I think it's, it's critically important that we take a look at what's happening in other cities and states across the country right now, because as they've gone reopened, they've reopened quicker, um, they're planning for today and tomorrow very quickly. We need to plan for the long term. How do we slowly do this so that we're not putting our most vulnerable folks at risk and that we're thinking about those essential workers who need to go back to work again because people are ready for, for life to resume. So I think the long-term planning has to be really done from that equity lens to understand it, but we can't just plan for the summer. We have to really plan well beyond that because that's how long COVID will be here, if not much longer than that. So let me get, uh, ask a follow-up on that. Um, I, uh, we, I just am fresh off doing a show all about education and we're seeing the same kinds of inequities that we've seen with food and with medicine, with COVID play out on, in terms of learning where um, communities that are lower income are falling much further behind yeah. and high school dropout rates and, um, and uh, future incomes are gonna be impacted to a much greater extent, whereas kids who are you know, home with white collar parents who are there and working from home, they have a whole set of advantages. One is like they might be able to, they might have more devices, the parents can help them, the parents might be able to help them more with, you know, let's say an English assignment where somebody who doesn't speak English at home maybe can't as well. Right. So how, these are such tricky things to balance. Yeah. How do you think that through? Yeah, I mean, Kara, it's, it's so interesting because the question, the question might be raised, you know, think about school reopening from an equity lens. Yeah. Right? And I could make the case that reopening schools in the fall is both, that's the equity view because of the disproportionate impact to low-income parents and not having school and, and the loss of learning. I can also make the case that um, not opening schools is the equitable way to approach the work given where we are with COVID and who will be most likely at risk. Um, and so I, I think that's the point. The point is, is that I think trying to understand the, the inequitable resources that are at the table. I mean, the city of Austin distributed thousands of Chromebooks all across the district, right? Which was important just to have the, the, the beginning of access as well as hotspots for internet. Mm -hmm. um, and then trying to figure out how to provide support to those where English was not their primary language to not only use the Chromebooks, but then to understand that, you know, the distance learning that nobody was really prepared for um, in public schools. So I think, again, I think it's so important that we don't lose sight 
that all impact is not created equal. And there's been that disproportionate notion that we've had to tackle. But I think, I will say, I think you've seen some really important examples of people go above and beyond to try to close gaps, to try to figure out um, how to do that, not only on the school side, but just for a second on the food side. I mean, without the support of the food bank and others, the city was able to lift up many, many food sites all across the city of Boston very, very quickly. Um, and I'll tell you, I think many people were surprised that the food need was so great. I can tell you, Dr. O and Catherine were not surprised that the food need was going to be so great. And so I, I think, again, it's, it's being realistic about these inequities that existed before COVID and how COVID just exasperated them and brought them to light. And that includes, that includes some of the challenges in our schools. Mm. Um, Doctor, you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of thinking about this issue of planning for the future, what kind of choices you make, but also, you know, how are you, how are you doing it? How are you thinking about what needs to be put in place for the next year or two or three? Right. I mean, I, I, I just want to highlight also sort of the time frame as well, because I think it can't be said enough. Um, particularly as, you know, the entire country has gone through this reopening and we're seeing some, um, you know, again, some um, ill effects in other parts of the country. Um, for, uh, for us, we really need to be thinking about, as you said, the year or two or three, because even if there is an effective vaccine, the fact that we'd have to get it distributed um, really fully along channels and have people accept it, because I believe there were some recent polls um, that actually show that there may be as high as like 30% of the population that mm. would not be interested in getting the vaccine, right? So there's there's a whole number of layer of things, uh, you know, before we all tag our hopes on a vaccine coming through, I think we all need to be very prepared for social distancing and masks being a common part of our life for the next one or two or three years. We all have to sort of plan for that as individuals, as well as agencies and, and communities and so forth. Um, but then, you know, along with that, I, I just, I can't highlight enough what Marty has just mentioned about using that equity lens and um, really making sure that all of us, whatever positions that we're in, are making sure we're thinking through that ex equity lens, that second layer or third layer and so forth, right? So, you know, for, for Dimmick, you know, the way that it's playing out is, um, as, as you probably know, most of healthcare is flipped to this telephonic or telehealth platform and flipped rather quickly, I should say, sort of in, in about, you know, sort of three months time, we've accomplished more in telehealth than we had in the last 10 or 15 years because of all sorts of other barriers and roadblocks. But, um, but I think to sort of continue to push on um, new models like that and, and also sort of making sure that different communities can engage on these new models that we're thinking about. So for us, telehealth, it's about making sure that people have the right access. If we wanna do televideo, do people have the capabilities of doing that? Do they even have the right spaces at home to be able to have private conversations? Um, we think a lot about our sort of mental health delivery of care. It's great we can do it over the telephone, but sometimes people in, in um, crowded households don't have the space to be able to sort of pull away um, and have private conversations with their doctor or their therapist or what have you. So, um, you know, while we're trying to sort of design innovative systems, we're trying to keep those different layers um, in mind. I think the other way to do it is with partners, right? So, um, you know, you may mention, I think Marty and Catherine about food distribution. You know, at Dimmick, we knew, for example, we have a Head Start on campus and we knew when we um, had to close down our Head Start, we knew that those children would not just be losing their in-person education, but they'd be losing a regular meal, you know, every day. And so, you know, we partnered with the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation through their generous support, and then a local black owned business, Fresh Food Generation, to create um, basically a whole system where we're um, uh, offering um, a regular uh, food distribution to our Head Start families. Um, and that's been going on for really a couple months now. And so I think that number one, I think awareness of leaders in different, um, uh, organizations with that equity lens, and then some creativity as well as the willingness to sort of work with all different partners to be able to solve these problems is, is where we've got to be. Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about, I know you are also thinking about the long term and how do you, you know, it does not look like coronavirus will disappear tomorrow. No, not at all. And. Um, we went to BCG because we use them a lot, Boston Consulting Group, to help us get a handle on this. They also had a lot of data. And we are planning at the Greater Boston Food Bank to be functioning at this level for through, through about March 2023. 
And wow. this is pre this is pretty much a new norm for us. So there's not a retreat occurring in our business. There's not going back. There is no going back. It really is how do we go forward and address many of the issues that are being um, brought up today to ensure that we can get food safely to people, that it can be um, the right food and to move them again from hunger to health. But we expect that the, the unemployment numbers are, are just astronomical. And then when you build in food insecurity into those numbers, it just doesn't move fast. I mean, not unlike Dr. Ho, we've seen a number of innovations occur in our industry where we couldn't do something and now we can. And it's helping get food much more quickly into communities and I believe that the future is very much going to be about that community level. It's going to be about creating greater access. I'm not sure if we'll have more programs or less, but I do think we will have more opportunities to, to reach communities in ways that we probably could never have imagined. And again, we're deeply committed to make sure that there's adequate food, that we build the capacity, of the network and the community that's being served, and that we do so in a safe way. You know, this is not a food board illness. Food is good, food is safe, food, we wanna get the food to you. It's the one thing when we talk about, it's not, we can't do telefood, and we can't do food by phone, except maybe delivery, but we have to get food to people. And so that's a little more challenging around the logistics and safety, but we're committed to do it. So let's start taking some questions from the audience. And there's a ton of questions that we've gotten that are basically along the lines of what is, if you could advise me on the single thing I could do to help, what would it be? So if you want, you can all take a crack at that. What could, they, what could somebody do who really wants to help in this situation? No, I'll, I'll be bold, go first. I mean, we, we talk about uh, money, is being the most important thing. Right now for my organization, and I think for those in the food pantry business, having the resources to, to ride this out because there will be donor fatigue. There will be a time when people go, well, this is fixed, right? And it won't be for a long time. So how do we keep people engaged to keep giving and to keep thinking about how we do better? And financial resources are a big part of that. So you give us the money, we can buy the food, we can distribute the food because we have real costs associated with that. I, I think people can also volunteer where and if they feel safe. And that's a big where and if, you know, relative to that. And uh, I know that uh, Marty and Dr. Ho probably have other suggestions as well. I mean, I, I, um, donations and money are so important like to the yeah. food bank and uh, Greater Boston Food Bank as well as to Dimmick which I think is important. Um, the city has lifted up the Boston Resiliency Fund, which raised about $32 million and has, admin and has distributed, uh, I think about $22 million mm -hmm. at this point um, and to organizations, primarily about 50% of organizations that are people of color led, which I think is important when you think about that equity lens that I don't wanna lose. Um, I also think another way to get to be give back um, is to truly, uh, walk the walk of, you know, physical distancing and facial covering and, you know, being mindful of our own actions and how they contribute to others. I don't want to lose sight of that. I think people, you know, um, it's easy to be like, you know, I'm fine and we're okay, but, you know, not to worry about others. So I think that's a really important piece not to lose sight of, um, but getting involved and, and, and making su and supporting organizations like uh, both Dimmick and Greater Boston Food Bank are really important. Yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm just going to add to that. I, I really echo everything that Catherine and Marty have said. Um, it, it seems like, you know, this, this, this issue is so complex and you've already heard sort of not just sort of the medical infection part, but you've heard about food gaps and, and job loss and housing and education. And so it seems so complex. Um, but I think the, the single thing that I would just recommend to folks is just is to learn about it, use that equity lens and take action and do something, right? And that something could come along many different lines. It could, as folks have said, uh, could be volunteering as they feel uh, safe and comfortable. Uh, certainly um, anything sort of um, 
uh, donating and uh, support to organizations that um, you feel are doing great work in this area is so important. Um, this is going to be a very, very long lasting um, problem that many organizations like Greater Boston Food Bank, like DIMIC, other community health centers, um, the city has done a terrific job with its resiliency fund. Um, but this is, um, you know, everybody I think feels like, wow, that was the first three months and our case rates are low. And so maybe we're good that we're looking at this for really years to come. And so I think um, educating yourself um, what, what the problems are, using that equity lens, and then going out there and taking action, whether that's donating, volunteering, um, giving in whatever way you can. Um, and also gonna say, you know, when the time comes, vote uh, is also really important. Um, those are all, I think, really, really important things that individuals can do. I think the other thing I would also mention is whatever your um, perspective is or, or what have you, um, there are ways that you can go out and partner, I think. Um, I think we, we invite creativity, we invite interest, we invite in engagement, enthusiasm. And so um, reach out, reach out, take action. Um, Dr. O, let me go back to you just for a second. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few questions that are sort of about mental health, mm -hmm. the stress of, um, yes. you know, being, the, people ask different things. So the stress of being worried about evictions, um, yes. the stress of like being inside, the issue of childcare. There's a lot of things about like mental health. And I, I don't know what your sense is of like the toll that it's taking and also the, um, the equity like piece of it, you know, the sort of, obviously you're going to be more stressed if you cannot uh, afford like a nanny to take care of your kids. And I, I mean, right, you can alleviate that stress in some ways with just a bunch of money. Um, so just talk about what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think that the mental health aspect of this cannot be ignored. And whether it's, um, you know, as you mentioned, sort of the stressors, um, the economic stressors or real life stressors that this has brought about to um, people and families, uh, th those are triggers in and of themselves for you know, depression, anxiety, and so forth. Or, or folks who actually have existing mental health illnesses or substance use disorders, mm -hmm. uh, the impact that these stressors have had, or even just the social isolation and what that has done um, to folks um, cannot be ignored. Um, our behavioral health um, service was probably the quickest to get online with telehealth. And interestingly, their activity has actually been beyond what's typical for us. It's probably running, it's certainly running over 100% of what our usual volume is um, to the point where we've actually, unfortunately, we're able to sort of get some funds to increase our capacity, increase our staffing, right? So um, I think that uh, making sure that mental health services are readily available um, to residents, to patients, to families is a pretty key component of that. And I think sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle as well. People are, you know, sort of may maybe more focused on infections or sort of the concrete sorts of things. Um, it's pretty important for um, health institutions or really all institutions to be aware uh, that mental health is a, a really big layer of this that, that uh, can't be ignored. And DIMIC is, is, you know, trying to be at the forefront of that just by increasing capacity, uh, still doing all that work, both telephonically as well as in person when it's appropriate um, and in an appropriate way. Uh, it's terrifically important. Again, that's going to be reverberating for a long while as well. I, I was talking to somebody the other day who was saying that um, uh, pediatricians have seen a rise in the mental health and like concerns among children. You know, it's just a, it's a completely different set of things that people are dealing with now, I think, than, than probably they, they ever have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can, can I just, can I? Yes, please do. Um, and it's interesting you said the pediatrician piece because on the other sort of end of the spectrum, I think uh, thinking about seniors and yeah. older Bostonians, I think, you know, we have an amazing uh, age strong commission here in the city that works diligently to combat social isolation um, of seniors, which we know seniors that are more socially isolated have um, poor health outcomes. And so we've been really focused to, you know, we have events and so many ways we engage seniors. Um, and yet right now is a time when we're telling seniors to stay home, avoid contacts with family members. We don't have these events that we have year round for folks to connect in their communities. Even seniors who live in group settings are not able to go to, you know, group, uh, group rooms together and watch movies and do things they would do. So I think it's just so important to keep in mind that that lack of physical and emotional connection um, is just as, as 
is challenging to someone's physical health. And that is not only true for young people, but for our seniors across the city. And we've heard it time and time again. So we're eager to sort of try to address some of that through our work. But I, I don't want that to get lost because our older Bostonians are struggling around with that as well. I Let me, um, this is a question from an attendee. Um, the question is, what about housing insecurity? How do you deal with property taxes, uh, rented housing? Are, you know, the, one of the questions is, are evictions blocked? And Marty, maybe I'll direct that to you. How do you deal with, I mean, speaking of stress, this is for sure a layer of stress, but, but how do you think about that going forward? Yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I think that the city's lifted up a couple of different resources, um, a rental relief fund for folks who could not benefit from federal, uh, federal sources or maybe didn't get the federal stimulus resources but had needed support around rental relief. Um, it's also true for those uh, folks that are undocumented in our community who are not getting some of the benefits that might be necessary um, to survive. Um, and our housing uh, stability office is um, answering calls and from folks who are struggling, who are trying to figure out how to navigate um, the ability to either pay a bill or take advantage of a resource. Um, but I think that's also true for folks who own small businesses. Um, who are also struggling and who might also be trying to keep people employed um, at the same time. So it really does increase not only the sensitivity of the work, but it's a traumatic experience to now be battling to figure out how to pay your bills and feed your family and, and things that maybe you hadn't been at that, that done that before. Um, let's be true though, a lot of folks in our communities live at that edge. And this has pushed many people over that edge. So I think that's been a challenge. And I think that's part of what's adding to sort of the, the real big challenge that is COVID here in Boston. Yeah. Cara? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, Marty mentioned, it, he just captured it because always people have traded their food dollars for housing, for medicine, you know, to pay the mortgage, to pay tuition, to pay a debt. It, it has always been there to pay their daycare bills. It's one of the, the leading expenses. So there's this complete upside down happening as well as so many new people in a situation because they were sitting on the edge and now they have tipped. They don't necessarily know where to go, uh, where, where the resources are. We've seen this a lot. So one of the things about the actions for us and, and encourage other is to share with people that these resources are available. There are places to go to get food. There are 1,300 sites, I think, in the state relative to schools and school meals. And then that will continue through summer feeding. But there are there's just so many people who don't know that it's okay to go get that assistance, whether it's our community health centers or food pantries or et cetera. But that is so true that that number there's just a large number of people right on that edge and they are now they cannot um they need just so much help everything is not, is is um being challenged food housing education medication take i mean th where are they going to go how are they going to get and i know marty sees a lot of this in the city and i'm sure dr ho sees this consistently with patients it isn't just a single issue it's, it's a multifaceted approach to how you have to help someone. And I think, Dr. Ho, you said it earlier that you, you try to help direct people when they come in, like, you, this is where you can get food, this is where you can get this, this is where you can get this. this it's, it's like starting over, I know, for a lot of us in terms of, of making sure people have the resources. But just an example that there are a lot of new people. Pantries are reporting that 50% of those individuals and families they've seen have never been to a food pantry before. Wow. This is actually a question that speaks to that, but um, I will direct it to uh, Dr. O, because I think there's a real, uh, the, there's a big medical component here, but there's a food component too. Um, it's um, from an attendee. I work at the Harvard Street Neighborhood Health Center in Dorchester. Um, during this pandemic, the biggest impact I see is the loss of health insurance due to loss of jobs, um, and that turns into food insecurities. This is ongoing and has hit the community extremely hard. We do have a food pantry as well, but the need is severe. And you know, Dr. O, I know you mentioned that issue before, of when people lose jobs, then that translates into people losing healthcare, 
wow, at just the moment when, whether it's COVID or whether it's um, a mental health issue, they, they might really need that, at just that moment, then they need that health care and they don't have it. Right, right. You know, I, uh, it's, it's a really, really important issue. And, you know, places like uh, DIMIC, Community Health Centers, Harvard Street, like the um, uh, audience member attendee, um, and I'm going to say, I think we're fortunate to be in the city of Boston where the idea of health is broader than just physical health. And I think we're fortunate mm -hmm. in that. And um, community health centers sort of in that space where health is not just the, you know, the, the blood pressure prescription that you're pushing across the table, right? We're, we're out there, we're trying to ask about, you know, your food situation, your housing situation, um, you know, childcare and so forth, because all of those things do impact um, whether someone, a, a person or a family can achieve that health and wellness. You know, so for example, um, I was actually just having a conversation earlier today with um, my director of operations, because uh, we were talking about how can we reach folks? Like it's, it's hard if somebody has lost their employer-based insurance, perhaps it's hard for them to know where to go to mm -hmm. even find out what do I do next? So we just had a conversation this morning about can we call some of our data um, to, and actually do more outreach calls to people who may have had commercial insurance listed uh, do some checks to see if it's still active or not. Maybe we can do some outreach and, and proactively say, look, you can come here to DIMIC and talk to our, you know, enrollment uh, counselors to see what you might qualify for. We're fortunate to be in Massachusetts where we actually have, you know, some pretty uh, great options for public insurance. Um, but it, it's sometimes it's a big barrier of, of people, residents, knowing where to go to ask those questions and feeling comfortable doing it. And so I think you know, we as an agency think, gosh, the more that we can make that more open outreach to people say, here's a place where you can ask. It's not just your blood pressure medication and your diabetes, but we can help connect you up to great partners um, to help get you food, to answer your questions about housing, your, your questions about insurance and so forth. Health is a big, broad um, um, issue and umbrella that we try to not just limit to physical health. And uh, Marty, there's a question. Um, are there specific resources for undocumented people, whether it's a food issue, rental assistance? Um, the attendee says that, you know, their experience is that people fear that requests for assistance will be held against them in the future. Um, and, and you, you know, the question is about sort of easing that anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, the rental relief fund, which I mentioned, was, was created for that exact pur for that exact purpose. Okay. Um, we've been clear with all of our messaging around food sites and access to food sites that um, you know uh, uh, immigration status doesn't matter. Um, we've also stressed that around testing for COVID. Right, that getting tested, you won't be asked on your immigration status. And again, that we make it accessible and, um, and be able to connect with it. Um, but I also think the data shows us that in certain communities, we've been seeing a disproportionate, you know, a disproportionate impact in the Latino community in terms of number of cases compared to population. Um, and some of the concern has been people get tested, test positive, and then don't know where to go to get resources. And even though we provide them, even though we're connected, folks are still struggling to find trusted resources especially now and especially with all the jargon around public charge and what it has meant and the information that was targeted towards immigrants and so I think unfortunately the perfect storm hit us here um, and the the anti-immigrant uh, message we've seen from our federal government has unfortunately created a much more difficult situation to keep people accessing care and accessing opportunities so we've been pushing that message the the city funded a bunch of organizations and an immigrant collaborative to be able to get resources directly to the organizations in the community um, but it's no question it's been a barrier and we continue to hear that um, not only in terms of what i can take advantage of but also, do I feel safe and trusted in that resource? Um, Dr. O, this is another medical one. Um, it's about uh, people with disabilities, but I think we could also probably expand it out to senior citizens. And it's about um, AIDS, you know, not maybe coming or not feeling safe to come anymore. And so you have people with disabilities. And I think this, again, could probably be expanded out to senior citizens where people are left without people to help them. Um, what do you do? Um, how do you, the question is like, how do you deal with the people left behind here? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, that's a, a, oh, it's a really difficult and challenging situation because again, looking through that equity lens, right, folks with disabilities or seniors um, are already um, have challenges sort of to accessing the system to begin with, and this has only made it harder. You know, the way that we've tried to deal with it at DIMIC is we've had our specific sort of resource, res, you know, sort of designated staff, resource coordinators, care managers, trying to reach directly out to our folks who we've identified within our own patient um, panels uh, as needing that additional support and that additional um, sort of help with navigating the system and finding, finding ways to sort of reach those resources or problem solve around the issues that come up because there are challenges around sort of PCAs feeling comfortable entering the home, um, sorry, um, you know, personal care attendants entering the home and so forth. Um, but sometimes there is some um, problem solving and advisement that we can give them around how to do it safely, um, what's the appropriate protection that they can use and so forth. But, um, you know, it's, it's challenging. The way that we've done it at DIMIC is really to try to provide that individual one-on-one -on -one sort of support with patients to, to try to problem solve around that. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly a challenge, but again, a lot of it has to be it's got to be on our radar screens, right, as professionals to um, really make sure we're thinking about um, sort of otherwise marginalized populations and, and reaching out and, and making it easier uh, for people to access what they need. So I'm going to, this is a, a, I think this is a really interesting question. I'm going to start with Catherine on this, but um, the, the uh, attendee says, the panelists have each powerfully talked about ways in which this public health crisis is both reinforcing and building on systemic inequities and health disparities. Are there ways in which the current situation might present new opportunities for addressing these inequities in our community? Like, are there, are there in all of this things that could come out of this that will be maybe positive or that could fix some of these issues? Catherine, you want to talk about what you're seeing? Sure, sure. I think there will be um, community organizations that probably touch food and they never did before. Mm -hmm. And that that incorporation of food, like health centers. I mean, we have nine community health centers we work with that have food, but there are so many more. There's one hospital that has a pantry in, in Boston, but there are so many more. And so that opportunity to connect, make food a part of the health, the, the community health and the public health of those that live and work with us is going to be very important. And I, I am certain we'll see new models. I am certain we'll see different partners in this work. And more importantly, I hope that we will be able to um, get deeper into the communities and listen so that we can ensure that that disparity is, is, doesn't continue. So where do we stop it? How do we do it? And I think food is a, is a universal way that we can begin to do that. And the biggest part of it is to get it into communities, give it to people who know where communities are hurting and how to distribute it and help them understand how to do it. Uh, Marty, you wanna, you wanna tackle it? No, the only thing I, I would add to that, and I appreciate Catherine's point, is that I do think it also gives us potentially an opportunity to look at issues that we know are issues in the community around health disparities, um, and we've seen how they've played out. So when we see, not, a, not around death from COVID, but when we see around severe hospitalization with COVID, and we see communities of color and folks um, living with uh, folks who are obese, or battling with diabetes. I think we've always known that we had higher rates of obesity and diabetes in communities of color um, that's been there, but we also have a real life example of A plus B equals C here, where we see folks that are more severely impacted are those folks dealing with these pre existing conditions. And so I do think it may give us the ability and maybe give us. I don't know, more courage to work upstream and not just to try to respond to the actual um, issue that people are facing now. So I, I think we've all, everybody wants to work upstream, right? We all, we all want to figure out what the root cause is, but I do think there may be some opportunities to really tackle some root causes um, in front of us because we know exactly how it plays out um, in the face of a really infectious disease. And Dr. O, are there ways that you think medicine will change in a, it, for the better? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, yeah, there, the, 
this the whole pandemic was a major disruptor that nobody anticipated at all and because of that all of us had to um pivot and and try new things that uh or, or should i say i might even say try old things that like took to glacial pace to actually do you know, one terrific example is what I mentioned before, telehealth. Um, we got more done and accomplished in terms of flipping to a telehealth system, the entire healthcare industry in honestly, just probably a few weeks time mm -hmm. than we did for the entire many years before that. And there were all sorts of barriers around regulations and reimbursements and so forth that tied everybody in knots before that, boy, when push came to shove and everybody needed to move to a telephonic or a telehealth platform, it, you know, it happened uh, lightning fast. So I think, and, and now what the healthcare industry is doing, and I've been in conversations with other community health centers, other primary care leaders about, hey, what can we take from this now? There's a lot of good that we've learned about telehealth uh, with regards to patient engagement, with regards to sort of, um, you know, sort of meeting patients and doing things in a more patient-centered way, what could we take forward from this, even when we're sort of post-pandemic, that could really be brought into the whole care model that will be more patient-friendly and so forth. So that's just one example, I think, of how the pandemic as a disruptor really pushed forward um, a tool or idea that I think uh, could have um, uh, some really terrific legs in, in terms of sort of a model going forward. And there's many other uh, ideas just like that. A final question for all of you, since we're, I mean, we had so many questions and uh, we could easily go on for a couple more hours. Um, but just give me that look into the future. And we've talked about a lot of different kinds. I feel like in some ways we've talked a lot of, about a lot of different kinds of health this hour. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what's your mental state in terms of worrying about your finances? That's a very serious thing. What's, what's your food, you know, state of your food? Um, what's the state of your kids in school? What's the state of your coronavirus test? You know, all these things, right? As you think about keeping people healthy in all these respects in Massachusetts, what do you hope is like at the forefront of our minds over the next, let's say, 6, 12, 18 months? Because I think we've all agreed this is, this is not something that, um, you know, I think at the beginning we thought, oh, this will be like a few weeks, and it, that's really not um, what it's going to be. Catherine, you want to go first? Is oh, you're so kind. Sure. 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 I, no, I, 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 it's a great question. And, you know, education is, a, is a, just a, a huge piece of this. Mm -hmm. and, but empowering, you know, giving, you know, letting communities um, take care of their community. And how can we help? How can we listen? How can we take action? And I think that it's been stated that we have to act. We have to do. We have to be there in the ways that people need us. And that means innovation and change. That means adjusting and not feeling as comfortable and doing it differently. And that's coming. And I think COVID has taught us that we have to work with new partners and uh, think in different ways and be innovative, not be afraid of it, and to not share the resources that we have with others. Marty, you want to talk a little bit about what's on the forefront of your mind in terms of keeping Massachusetts a healthy place in the next like year-ish? Yeah, I think, Karen, I think it's um, if people are remembering the interconnectedness of, of our own actions and, and how they keep other people healthy, right? I mean, I, I think, um, you know, for, for when, when facial coverings first, we started talking about facial coverings, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lowe, our medical director, um, the mayor and I both kept trying to say to her like, so, but it protects people themselves, right? It really does keep us safe. And she kept saying, you can't really say that. That's not actually the case, not these kinds of coverings. Um, it's really about protecting others and protecting your neighbors. Um, and the thought that we're in that facial covering is, to, is, is much more about the people that you see and you interact with and engage with. And I think taking that well beyond facial coverings, but taking it into you know, what's happening in our community needs us to remember that we're interconnected. If a restaurant opens and you want to go there, um, someone has to work there essential workers are there and they're interacting with folks and they're putting themselves potentially at risk um, because people are ready to go out to eat and ready to go back um, to life. So I just think for me, if we can keep that interconnectedness really mindful um, and remember that our actions impact others um, probably more than ever before. Um, that's the piece I would hope we all keep in mind as we move forward. 
I have to say, you probably all feel this too, but I've been feeling very proud of Massachusetts in that way. I do feel like we have been really keeping that community in, in mind. I mean, there's always more to do, but I feel like, oh, I'm proud to be like in Massachusetts. We're doing a good job. So I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> um, and Dr. O, I don't think you got to answer this, right? Did you? Yeah, I, 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 I would highlight again that, um, you know, the social distancing, the masking and really doing this for your community is a really, really important thing. And for the long term, mm -hmm. I think people need to remember that. And I think the other thing is just, um, you know, we've heard a lot today about uh, all the reverberating impacts in so many different ways. I think uh, if there's anything I would love to impart upon people is really all these racial and economic inequities are so deeply woven into every system um, that it can seem daunting. Um, how do we even tackle this? But but I, I guess, again, I would just go out there and say, just start, take action, educate yourself, talk to people, learn about uh, what opportunities are out there uh, and use that uh, lens of equity and just start. Thank you so much. This has been such a great hour. I feel like we're just getting, as you said, we're just getting started, but, um, <laughs> but it's been great. I want you to know that if you did submit a question and I thank you in the audience, what an amazing group of, we must have had just, I don't know, a lot of questions. Um, we will keep all of your questions. We'll get them to our panelists. Um, and I just want to thank Catherine, Marty, um, uh, Holly, and on behalf of the Museum of Science and WGBH, thank you all in the audience, most of all, for coming, for being a part of this, for being interested in this, and for getting out there and, um, and getting involved in your community. So thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>